Okay, let's talk about the components of the normal and derive its expression in terms of the shift tensor, basically, because of course the shift tensor describes the tangent plane and the normal is orthogonal to the tangent plane, so of course it's somehow expressible as a shift, in terms of the shift tensor. And actually the expression that I will write down is not so frequently used, it's not so important. That's because the normal is defined, quote unquote, implicitly by the fact that it's unit length and orthogonal to the shift tensor. So previously we would write that it's orthogonal to the covariant basis by saying n dot s alpha equals zero. But if you rewrite n dot s alpha in terms of the components, then of course you will get exactly this. So this defines the normal as well as the explicit expression for all practical intents and purposes having to do with the differentiation of the normal. But of course it's nice to have an explicit identity, an explicit expression for the normal. And I'm about to write it down for n equals 3, so our ambient space is three-dimensional, our surface is two-dimensional. The expression would have to be just like the case with determinants. The expression would, be, would have to be adjusted for every dimension. That's a fine, it's a disadvantage of the tensor notation. Okay, so you know this whole approach to understand this formula, just remember the fact that the normal is often described as the cross product of the two basis vectors on the tangent plane, of any two vectors on the tangent place. Of course, we'll use covariant vectors on the tangent place. That's not enough, though, because you also have to make it unit length. And remember, the normal is always defined with respect uh, up to the sign. So when you cross two vectors in the tangent plane, you can cross first one with second one or second one with first one, and depending on the order, you would get two different directions. So that's sort of the inspiration for the formula that I will write down. But of course, it will have the added benefit of being unit length. If you do the cross product trick, you also have to divide by the length of whatever you get, which introduces ugly square roots. Uh, there's no avoiding ugly square roots when you want something to be unit length, but at least what I'm about to write down, the tensor notation at least hides it perfectly. So here's the idea. The idea is, uh, so I'll kind of build up the formula, not rigorously, but we'll just check these properties and then we'll be satisfied with that, that we got the right expression. So the idea is that we have to cross two basis vectors, and the basis vectors are contained in the shift tensor. So zi alpha it are the elements, are the components of the surface metric tensor, of the surface basis with respect to the ambient basis. So if we look at z1 and z2 i and j, right, this will, you know, what I have Right now, side by side, the two basis elements. And of course, one and two is not pretty from the tensor calculus point of view, so they'll go away in a moment, actually. So we have to find their cross product. At the time that I'm recording this, I haven't talked about cross products yet and how to express them in terms of the Levi Civita symbols. Of course, the book has it in great detail, and I will definitely talk about it just as soon as I uh, run out of more exciting things to talk about than the cross product and the curl, which to me uh, are simple subjects, not so much fun to talk about. But I will, I owe it to you, I will talk about it, and if you're watching this a few weeks down the road, or maybe even as soon as a month down the road, those lectures will have been backfilled. I think I'm saving number seven for those topics. And maybe you'll, by that point, know that to find the cross product between these two vectors, you have to multiply, contract it with epsilon i j k. So this is the cross product of these two vectors. And that maybe will give us the normal n sub k. So at the very least we're on the right track. So what, what of course we don't like about this 
is number one, of course, there's no guarantee that this is unit length. The change that I'm about to make will actually guarantee that it's unit length. But of course, this one and two are ugly. So the way to combat having explicit one and two, just put alpha and beta and multiply the whole thing by the Lebesgue Chimita symbol on the surface epsilon alpha beta. So this introduces two terms. When this is one and this is two, and then with a minus sign when this is two and this is one. But of course, if you do a couple of those switching exercises, you'll realize that it'll be the two minus signs will cancel and you realize it's two of the same, it's two of the same quantities. So this would sort of give us the normal twice, so you have to divide it by 2, and this is really n minus 1 factorial. So this actually is the right expression. So let me just write it down here in a pretty way. n sub k is actually 1 over 2 factorial, because that's how it generalizes to higher dimensions. And it has to be epsilon i j k because we're doing the cross product, followed by epsilon alpha beta because we're trying to get rid of those explicit one and two, followed by the two shift tensors z i alpha, z j. Let me make it horizontal. Epsilon alpha beta Z I alpha Z J beta. And there you go. An explicit expression for the normal. Okay? So now let's just make sure that these two properties are satisfied. And then as an exercise, I will let you prove this final, this property, ni, the projection property, and j that we discussed in last lecture is delta i j, the projection interpretation, minus z i alpha, z alpha j. This is the more involved of the three proofs, so I'll save it for you. Uh, as exercise. So let's prove, let's start with this property and see what we have. So we'll write it as nk z k alpha. I'm keeping the index k from here so we don't have to do too much of renaming uh, and I will actually call this gamma because alpha and beta will be needed on the right hand side equals one half Epsilon i j k, epsilon alpha beta, and here we go. Z i alpha, z j beta, z k gamma. And if you just focus, I will actually am able to say equals zero right here, because if you focus on just this triple product, Going back to working with delta systems and the levi chivita symbol and permutation symbols, it's easy to show that this combination is skew-symmetric in alpha and beta. And likewise, it's skew-symmetric in beta and gamma. And of course, it also is skew-symmetric, anti-symmetric in alpha and gamma. So with the switch of any two of those indices, it changes sign. So it's actually fully skew-symmetric in alpha, beta, and gamma. And that means it's zero because it's, it's a two-dimensional system. Not so much two-dimensional, but it lives in two-dimensional space. So you have this fully skew-symmetric system where indices only have values one and two. So of course it's zero. Why? Let's call it the pigeonhole principle. Any, there will be at least one index that has the same value, and as soon as there's a repeated value of the indices, the result is zero. So this is very easily seen to be zero. If you disagree, as far as this being easy to see, I recommend you review all of the techniques having to do with permutation symbols and skew symmetric symbols. 
Let's now do the more challenging identity, which is this one, and we'll just see if it fits in the space. So, what I will need is NK, NK. All right, let's see. N, K, N, K. I'll bail out of this proof if I have to. And you'll never find out because I just won't post. So equals one half and one half combined. So I'll just write it down as one quarter. Okay. Epsilon, epsilon I, J, K, epsilon alpha, beta, Z, I, alpha, Z, J, beta. That's N with a lower K. Now comes A with an upper K. Epsilon, R, S, K. All right, so K is the same as this K, but these two need to change. Epsilon, omega, delta. The first two letters that came to mind. Z, R, omega. Z, S, delta. Now, I think I'll run out of space, but I'll just give you a preview of what happens and just try to pull off as much as I can, but maybe I'll have to put more in words than in equations. The two objects that combine are these two. This becomes the full delta system, RSK, IJK, and of course by thinking back to the delta systems, I mentioned several times that those identities are very important. It's for these reasons, because epsilons have tendencies of quote unquote touching each other. And when they touch each other with contraction, it default, falls back to a lower order delta system, which can then be broken up into this combination of chronic deltas. Delta I R, delta S J, minus delta, excuse me, delta S I, delta R J. Okay. Followed by, I will now combine these two epsilons into a single delta, delta alpha beta omega delta, and of course this delta can also be expanded according to this expression, z i alpha z j beta z omega r z delta s. <coughs> okay, now when when you multiply this out by bringing these shift tensors in here, I will stop at this point and let you complete it because it's actually, even though it becomes a little bit uh, large, it's actually quite enjoyable to see how these shift tensors, the indices, get renamed and lots of nice contractions occur. And because the contractions are on the Latin indices, at least in this case, uh, you will get a lot of chronic deltas, which will make a lot of terms disappear. And then you will work with this object by the same rule as we did here, and the rest will disappear, and you'll just have four remaining terms, which will be 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, combined with a quarter, it equal 1. So, uh, I invite you to complete this exercise. It's very good in terms of working with shift tensors and proper contraction relationships, as well as permutation symbols and so forth. But these two proofs, this one partial, uh, really justifies this expression as the explicit expression for the norm. Now, this one can also be shown, uh, even though we've already proved it from other considerations without ever needing an explicit expression for this symbol. 
it would actually still be quite nice to verify now that we know the explicit expression for the normal, even though we already know this to be true from geometric considerations. But these two identities should convince you that this is the proper expression for the norm. And just because I only gave you a partial proof here and invited you to complete it, let me just say how this identity follows from here. Well, this identity follows from here because if you contract an i and j, if you already accept this, then this will convince you that this still holds, if you accept this from geometric considerations. If you just assume that i, that i and j are the same, so there's contraction in i and j, so we might, might as well write it in. You will, of course, realize that this is delta i i, which is 3. And this is now that we're also contracting on the Latin index. Let's do that first. This will turn it into a delta alpha alpha, which on the in the space of dimension 2 is, of course, 2. So you have 3 minus 2 equals 1, just as we wanted to prove. Actually, this is perfectly clean, because this was derived geometrically in a way that's satisfactory, and now we've shown that this holds. Uh, let me see. No, it's not. It's not a satisfactory proof of the fact that this is the proper expression for the norm. So completing this would be the right way to go. This this was more of a sanity check now that I think about it. Alright? This completes the discussion of the normal and next we'll talk about the wonderful chain rule for covariant differentiation. Thank you very much.